Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I founded this company a few years ago with the goal to develop therapies for orphan CNS conditions with high med medical need. Today, uh, we are leading the space with MIN-102 in a particular disease called adrenal leukodystrophy or ALD. Um, we are also moving into other indications with the same molecule, uh, such as Felix ataxia, and I will talk about these two uh, uh, diseases. And we're also preparing to move into additional conditions with the same molecule, because of the based on the mechanism of action, it has a potential to go beyond these two indications. We are a very small company located in Mataró, north from here, founded in back in 2011. Uh, and we have most of the team here in, in Mataró, but also have some people in, in the south of Brussels, in Charleroi. This is just a snapshot of, of the clinical trials that we have or the development that we have uh, in development, uh, mostly ALD and flex ataxia. And as I said, we are preparing for moving into other spaces. So to start, let me talk a little bit about the molecule and why we think that this is a good candidate or good molecule for this kind of disease. Um, MIN-102 or Leriglitazone is a PIPAR gamma agonist. This is a small molecule. There, are, there have been several PIPAR gamma agonists around, and some of them has been in the, in the market already for diabetes. But the issue with this PIPAR gamma agonist is that the lack of sufficient brain penetration to have sufficient levels in the CNS for efficacy. There was a pioneering work on the space of ALD uh, and PIPAR gamma agonists led by Aurora Pujol in Edibel in, here in Barcelona. They demonstrated that this mechanism of action could be used for ALD, but the issue of that particular molecule was to achieve those sufficient levels. And that's precisely with what we can achieve with MIN-102. This is a molecule that reaches the brain at sufficient level and modulates the target at the required level for efficacy, at least based on what we know from preclinical studies. It's uh, orally bioavailable, so it's easy uh, for patients from that perspective. It's once a day after breakfast, and we use the molecule as an oral suspension <coughs> instead of the classical tablet. And this is because we want to be sure that all patients are uh, receiving the right level of compound. So we control or we monitor uh, plasma levels for all patients and we adjust, if necessary, the dose. The advantage of having a suspension is that we can also develop the same drug product, the same formulation for children. And that's also development that we are doing. In free exataxia, we are enrolling children. And in ALD, there's also pediatric population. So that was the second key reason for developing a neural suspension. We have orphan drug designation in Europe and in the US for the treatment of XALD. We have IP, granted IP, and also the CMC is ready for multi-kilo scale-up. And because based on the states where we are, pretty close to the market, all the CMC is another part that is, is less fancy than the biology, but it also needs to be pretty well controlled. The molecule does many things. Um, and that's the reason why it works in a such a complicated disease where there are many things happening at the same time. It has an antioxidant and neuroprotective effect, not just in ALD or fixed ataxia, this is in, in multiple conditions. It has a very potent anti-inflammatory activity, not only in the CNS, but uh, in the CNS as well, if the compound is there. Again, this under different uh, inflammatory stimulus uh, than the, the molecule is anti-inflammatory. It improves mitochondrial function. It has a, some of the pathways are very much linked with, the, with mitochondria. I will talk a little bit about pathways later on. It also ameliorates the lipid metabolism. That was one of the original reasons uh, for the molecule. But um, in vivo, it improves the white matter structure in different models, promotes remelination, and this is because of different reasons, because it improves oligodendrocyte differentiation, but it also protects oligodendrocytes themselves, and also improves myelin debris uh, clearance, among other things. And finally, it delays disease progression in animal models, at least. Why ALD? Uh, ALD is our primary indication. There are some of historical reasons for that, but also we think that it's a very good case to validate this, this biology in the CNS for this molecule. ALD is an, is an orphan neurogenerative condition. Um, it's a pretty well-organized community, not as well-organized as some other uh, rare diseases, but improving quite a lot. And since we started in this field a few years ago, th this situation changed quite a lot. And there are some organizations at the international level, such as ALD Connect, which are quite powerful today. It has different phenotypes. Um, to start, 
patients, most of the patients have adrenal dysfunction, but if we focus on, on the cerebral form or the CNS related, the most aggressive form of the disease is cerebral ALD. This can affect uh, children or adults, but it's typically seen in children, and death comes after two, four years from onset. So it's very aggressive and, and rapid uh, uh, disease, except <laughs> if patients go through bone marrow transplant. In that case, the, the, this therapy can, can really stop the disease, or gene ex vivo gene therapy is in late development for this form of the disease as well, showing similar results as the transplant, but both are pretty aggressive for the patients in any case. Then there's the most common form of the disease, because mo most of the patients that are alive today have this form of the disease. Essentially, all patients reaching adulthood develop this form of the disease, uh, starting at the 20s. is uh, characterized by a uh, spinal cord, uh, are related is axonal degeneration in the spinal cord leading to motor dysfunction mostly, spastic paraparesis, so on and so forth, urinary incontinence. So there's, there's several different things, but essentially this is affecting adults, men. But today we also know that women is also affected. This is an X-linked disorder. A few years ago it was considered to affect only male. Even in some of our slides at the beginning we were saying affects males. No, AMN is also affecting most of the women that are carriers. The difference is the age of onset, which in case of women comes much later, and the disease severity. Women do not develop cerebral form of the disease in most of the cases. So, and for AMN, there's nothing at all, no treatment at all, and here is where we are the most advanced in the space. The disease is monogenic, so it's one single gene being affected. It's a, it's a gene related with the transport of very long chains fatty acids into the peroxisome for the degradation. When this is not uh, functioning normally, there's accumulation. It's unclear if the accumulation is the trigger or is a biomarker or a, a consequence, but uh, is there. And there are multiple pathways being affected, the, from the mitochondrial function, ox oxidative stress, inflammation, those same pathways that are modulated by PPAR gamma agonism. So that's essentially our target. These downstream pathways is what we are trying to correct in this disease. In ALD, we did multiple studies, just to summarize briefly, in, in, in in cell-based kind of models, we see that the molecule protects astrocytes, uh, oligodendrocytes, motor neurons against very long chain fatty acid induced cell death. It also recovers mitochondrial function, this is here, reduces the oxidative stress here, and in the case of oligodendrocytes, as I said before, it improves the differentiation uh, and the phagocytosis of myelin debris. Also, it reduces microglia activation, which is also seen in, in multiple diseases now. When we go to animal models, uh, to validate further this, this concept, we use different models. The first one that we use is a, a knockout model. The issue of this model is that it is very mild. So you can only see changes at the level of biomarkers, no, almost nothing at the level of motor function. But it's good enough to, to look at the pathways. And we see that the same pathways that we see that are modulated in vitro, this is translating in vivo. The inflammation, mitochondrial function, and oxidative stress. So to use another, uh, or, or to test in a more aggressive model, we use a double knockout model. In there's another protein called ABCD2, which is kind of complementary with ABCD1. Uh, in mice, when both are knocked out, the, the phenotype is much more aggressive, and in here it can be seen a, a dysfunction in terms of motor function. When we treat the animals with different doses, we see a nice recovery of motor function with a dose response, so nice kind of data for those that work in vivo. Um, we also look at the inflammatory component of the disease, uh, because inflammation, as I said, is, is very important, in par particularly in the pediatric form of the disease, but also for the adults there's an underlying inflammation. There's no model for inflammation in CLD, so there's no model of cerebral ALD yet. So we look at other inflammatory models, and in this case, a model called EAE that is a model used for multiple sclerosis, typically. And some of the drugs that are today in the market are effective in this animal model. CLD and multiple sclerosis are pretty similar in terms of the lesions that are forming in, in the brain. In this model, looking at inflammation, we see a very nice reduction in inflammation in vivo at the same dose range as in the motor function. So that's what allows us to conclude, among some of the data that we have, that the molecule may work for both forms of disease. Just to have some more mechanistic details of what's happening in, in ALD, for those interested in the basic biology, 
Uh, ALD is pretty complex, as, as I was saying before, so different pathways that are affected uh, because of this deficiency of ABCD1. The molecule being very selective because it's a PIPAR gamma algorithm driven effect, it has multiple consequences. PIPAR gamma once activated blocks an FKP beta and this has the uh, anti-inflammatory uh, component. It also modulates different genes that are described that to be related with neuronal survival and the oligodendrocyte differentiation. And it also interacts with another protein called PGC1-alpha, which is one of the master regulators of, of mitochondrial biogenesis, and that is related with all the mitochondrial-related effects of the molecule. In the case of the CLD form, there's uh, some other uh, activities that are interesting. CLD, again, is, 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 is complex in the sense that it's not completely understood what happens there. But it's clear that there are different mechanisms that are uh, involved. Uh, to start, there's a, an increase or, or a BBB disruption, uh, uh, monocyte activation, uh, the macrophage immigration, microglia gets activated, uh, and then uh, there's a neuronal death and the myelination. There are multiple mechanisms occurring there. And we tested the molecule in different settings, looking at these different uh, um, pathways. And we see that the mean 102 of PIPAR gamma agonism uh, prevents the uh, endothelial cell activation. This keeps the BBB intact. Uh, also reduces monocyte activation, reduces the microglia activation in different models. Astrocyte survival is improved, neural survival, oligodendrocyte survival. So that's, that's why we think that a molecule that is very specific on the mechanism of action but doing multiple things, we believe that can work in a very complicated disease where multiple things happen. In our opinion, it's very difficult to be efficacious in this very complex disease if you are only targeting one of these different processes that are occurring in the cell, because uh, the, all of them are, end up being important at the end. So how to move or how to develop a molecule such as this in a disease such as ALD? Well, when we started in this uh, a few years ago now, the situation was the same situation as many rare diseases, unfortunately is absence of regulatory guidelines, absence of established trial methodology, no scales, absence of natural history data. So with that, develop a drug in the clinic. So what we did is to follow a stepwise approach that, that, that's same as can be followed by other diseases. And is first is to try to understand very well which is the efficacy that we need to achieve or the levels or the exposure that we need to achieve or what we need to achieve in animals to be efficacious. Then see how we can uh, study that uh, if it's translating into humans in a first study, in a case of phase one kind of a study. Um, confirm this and then try to understand the disease progression in, in the clinic and interact with the key people, PIs, patients, regulators, so on and so forth to develop or to, to design the study. So first to understand how much compound or how much modulation of the receptor we need to achieve. That was where we use all these animal models that I referred to. We developed PKPD models. That was also allowing us to better understand the general uh, concept of PIPAR gamma algorithm and show that previous therapies that have been developed with this same mechanism of action were falling by far short of sufficient uh, PIPAR gamma modulation in the brain. That was allowing us to estimate the level of PIPAR gamma engagement required for efficacy. We went to the clinic in a phase one study with healthy volunteers, but also looking at PIPAR gamma engagement in the CNS, so, and also compound levels in the CSF of, of these patients. And what we saw is that the, the drug, first of all, was tolerated at the, at the tested doses. Of course, that was the primary objective of the phase one, but also important, this figure here is very important for us. This is PIPAR gamma engagement and the blue area is the levels that need to be, that w have been seen in efficacious doses in animals. In the multiple ascending dose, we fall just in the right range. So our predictions in terms of the right doses and so on were pretty correct. And this is pioglitazone, this is uh, that drug I referred to at the beginning, a drug that's been used for diabetes, actually is still in the market for diabetes. And this is what can achieve. So really falling too short in order to have sufficient uh, PIPAR gamma engagement for a CNS efficacy. So that allows us to, to select the dose um, for the phase two, three trial. The issue with the phase two, three trial was that no, there was no methodology. So we, it was not possible or not clear, no papers telling us which should be the trial. 
So we had to define that ourselves. So to do that, we look at the different studies that were around. There was a study where people tested Lorenzo's oil. And maybe you've seen a film from called Lorenzo's oil. That's the story of a, of a natural product that was developed in the US. And by the same group that identified the gene and, and identified the disease initially, Hugo Moser in, in the Kennedy Krieger Institute. The film was done in a, in a moment where people thought that the, the drug was efficacious, which is not. Uh, the afterwards, there was some trials and there was not show, it was not showing efficacy. But we had access to the st that study that included the placebo control group. And we also uh, worked with a group in, in Netherlands that was now uh, developing or, uh, or running a natural history study. So we took all this data together, we analyzed the data, and we were able to identify some outcomes that were progression, progressing sufficiently in the period of time of the, of that we were planning to use the, or to treat the patients. Um, so the, the trial design is really data driven. So it's not uh, what we think that works or that changes, the outcomes that we think that changes, but the outcomes that we have seen that change in, in a period of two years, that is the treatment duration. Afterwards, because this is a pivot, potentially a pivotal study if it works, we want to validate this with regulators, which is an essential uh, step uh, in, the, in, this, in this space. So we want to see the a EMA and FDA. Of course, we did all this process together with the QLs of the space and patients. It's also very important for us to have outcomes where patients feel comfortable and so that we can understand the disease from the, all the different perspectives. So the outcomes, without entering into all the details, we group it in, in three groups. But, uh, that's uh, uh, arbitrary. Uh, classification, what we call more regulatory-related outcomes, which is essentially the primary outcome, which is the six-minute walk test, together with some other objective measurements, muscle strength, and some scales. But this is also important to get an, this holistic view of the disease to combine this with other kind of outcomes, such as those that are more relevant for the patient perspective. And here there are the patient-reported outcomes, which are more and more important in, in drug development today. Other outcomes, such as the incontinence, this is something that worries a lot patients. And also, um, of course, the conversion into cerebral ALD. AMN patients can develop cerebral ALD, and this is deadly uh, for them. So we are also looking into that. And of course, complemented with exploratory biomarkers and imaging technologies that we are using um, quite a lot. The study was initiated in December 2011. It's fully recruited. Actually, we recruited ahead of time, which is surprising <laughs> in a way for a rare disease and even with some more patients than what we were initially targeting so the team did very well there and I think that is also showing that there's a big or high capacity medical need in this disease and also showing that the community is starting to be well organized because uh, your team can work very well but if these other things are not there uh, it's usually not that easy to recruit. Um, it's the largest trial ever in this indication and most of the patients all of the patients are recruited, but many of them are already beyond one year of treatment, and, and we expect data by the end of next year. So two years treatment, no interims, and, and so on, and you can see all the sites that are involved. So if you are familiar with ALD, you see most of the key people in ALD space in this figure. Then we have CLD. So in CLD, we are not uh, with an, an active trial right there yet, but we are preparing to launch a trial. Uh, it offers a unique opportunity, we believe, I mean 102, because we've seen that has different uh, uh, contributions to the CLD progression. So we think that in the early stages of the disease, there's an opportunity for this molecule before patients have to go into a transplant. And we are now in the place of putting together a trial, a phase two trial in this case, targeting boys between two and 12 years. Um, this case, a trial driven by imaging, brain MRI, and looking into the, into the brain of these patients. And we believe that this is, is complementary with the transplant. We are not saying that, that we are transplant is not going to be needed, but what we know is that these patients progress very rapidly. And sometimes they lose the window of transplant because the donor is not found on time. So whatever opportunity can be developed there that stops or diminishes the disease progression, it's, it's, it's really welcome. And I will finish expl explaining a little bit what we are doing to expand beyond um, ALD, and in this case, in free exataxia, where we did the same process, eh, essentially. So I'm not going to be as detailed in this case, but we follow the same, the, same, the same approach. First is to try to understand the disease. In this case, it's, again, neurodegenerative condition, uh, 
related with the, with the deficiency of frataxin genes, leading to essentially mitochondrial dysfunction. So this is the most relevant component of the disease. It has different uh, um, effects different, in different ways, patients. On, the, on one side, there's the ataxia component of the disease, but there's also a cardiomyopathy and di diabetes for some patients, not all of them. The onset is between 5 and 18 years in most of the cases, although there are some cases of later onset, and there's no treatment approved again. So again, another disease with a high combat medical need and, and very severe condition. So here we did, uh, together with the people that understand the disease and has the animal models, by the way, there are no CROs with models of ALD, no CROs with models of Felix ataxia. So we need to work with, the, with academic groups that know how to uh, run these models and understand the disease. That would be in ALD, that would be it in, in Felix ataxia. Here we look at different, uh, uh, different systems. In the dorsal root ganglia neurons, we see an increase of survival uh, and decrease in neurate degeneration. We see an improvement of the mitochondrial function. Uh, this is related with this figure here. Upon silencing of, of, of frataxin, there's a, um, there's a change in membrane potential. This is related with the function of, of, of mitochondria, and this is normalized with the treatment with MIN-102. The re restoration of energy production, and also an, an effect on motor function. So there's different animal models that we tested. So potentially a disease-modifying therapy for, for uh, free addicts attacks as well. This study started very recently, so we did the press release of the, of the approval of the study a few weeks ago. We have not done the press release of the first patient randomized, but uh, we will do it uh, very soon. Um, again, as I said before, very important for us to work with the key people in the space. So we are a tiny company, we are not experts in any of these diseases at the end of the day. So we need the experts to work with us, um, and we are very grateful for that. We did exactly the same process to look at data to select endpoints, not to select endpoints based on what we think that is important, but to look at the data and try to understand. And here we had a close collaboration with a group in Minnesota that is running a natural history study, that they have data that is not yet public, so I cannot show you the data, but that was telling us that there are imaging technologies that can be used to understand this progression and that we are using pretty state-of-the-art technology, the imaging technologies for that. Again, it's a, it's a shorter treatment, it's one year, but uh, we are expecting results in parallel with the other study, so end of next year as well. And again, if you are familiar with this space, uh, you see uh, that we, have, we are working with the key people in the space as well, in the countries where we have active, active trials, including Barcelona, of course. Um, in this case, a trial is a phase two study, so it's, it's, it's more intended to validate the concept than to get a regulatory approval at the end. It's a smaller study, 36 patients to be enrolled, and may mostly driven by imaging. Yeah. But we also combine this with clinical scales, uh, also some motor tests, biomarkers, and so on and so forth. So just to finish, I have to, to acknowledge the people that uh, that been helping us to start, those that provided the funding. So we have many in BC or venture capital investors from different places, uh, Spanish, French, Italian, Swiss, Belgians. But we also got strong support from, from different uh, uh, public institutions, local, uh, Spaniards, so, and also at the European level. So we are very grateful for that. And this is a team effort. So this is, as I said before, so this is not something that we can do alone at Munich with 20 people. So you need much more than that. So that's why we have a broad network of, of collaborators that they are listed here in this slide. This is more for the non-clinical kind of work. Of course, all the clinical sites are very important for us, and I showed them in the previous slides. Some other people that's been helping us uh, in the process, some other advisors, and last but not least, of course, our, our team that is working very hard, those that are at the company today, but those that have been with us in the past. And thanks to them is why I can be here explaining this, this nice story to you. And that's it, and I thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark. If the trial goes well, but <laughs> I think it's, I think the looking at the it's, it's so interesting. I don't know if anyone has any question. Yeah. 
Thank you very much for a really good talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, the mutations in the ABCD1 gene, are they loss of function or missense? Do you have any residual activity left of the transporter? Yes, I hear fine. <laughs> There are many, many different mutations. So, um, and we are not actually we are not looking into that because we are acting downstream of the of the pathway, and so we don't we don't really care about this 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 point. So, but there are all kinds of mutations, and essentially the disease is driven by a deficiency of a function. So, lack of function. Okay, thank you very much again, Mark.